podcast. I am the undead Matt. And I'm uh, Krampus Cody. <laughs> and aside from our phones going off to alert you, we are here to remind you that, again, we're getting near the end of the line. We're getting near the end of that tunnel. People are getting vaccinated. So just be patient a little longer. We'll get through this. I trust all of you. And also, while you're at it, why don't you go and continue supporting some more indie bands, especially the ones that we've had on here on the show. Go check them all out. Go give them some love. Go give them some support. And all the same thing with even podcasts that you like. Show the love. Leave them ratings because, believe it or not, those iTunes ratings do matter. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a huge thing. It actually, yeah, it's a it's, really funky algorithm and stuff. So just, you know, go out there. But you know, whether it is us or another show, reach out to them. Tell them what you like about them. Tell them what they're, you know, doing right. And you know, just give them that little attaboy. You know, because mm-hmm. it back to the you matter can, is, is they can't even literally it. say attaboy. You can you can say attaboy from or at a girl or at a person. You know what? Go <laughs> go comment on go write reviews for all of your other favorite shows and just say add a person. From <laughs> see if we get a tread going and see if people can be like, who the fuck is Pug Rock Over Podcast? <laughs> Why is there so many of us getting an add a person? Who's an add a person? What's an add a person? <laughs> They're like, and there's gonna be the one person that knows, and like, no, see, it's like add a boy, but no one wants to assume your gender, so just add a person <laughs> <laughs> or add a human. Yeah, whichever add a, one. Add a human sounds more sci-fi like. I like it. Add a human. Add a human. Add a human. We worked for years to create the initial <laughs> of the uh, add a human, part human, part Adam, ultimately <laughs> destructive. <laughs> But like, there's any, no way to actually destroy it. <laughs> like a flashback of like somebody getting so mad at like traffic that they just like blow up and level the whole like highway. <laughs> My leg. <laughs> it just I'm sick of <laughs> Green means go. <laughs> My leg. <laughs> It's eradicated. Oh, God. It doesn't exist anymore. Now I can't press the gas pedal. (laughs) (laughs) That's all. That's also would be a great stupid power to have that you could only use once because it would it would have to kill you, you know, like, oh, my no, no. See here. The thing is, is that like. You you live through it, so you that's the that's like the curse of that superpower is that you only use it once, and it's random, and you have to live with the consequences. <laughs> I mean, I could see it going good and bad for that person because it's like, like if you live, like I don't know, like I think it depends on where you literally decide to blow up. <laughs> like, like if you blow up at a McDonald's. They're probably not going to let you come back to a McDonald's. And that's probably going to make it harder for you to go to any fast food joint in general. So, like, if you love KFC, (laughs) say goodbye to that. You just see, like, they all get together and, like, look, this person's not allowed in any fast food joint ever again. Why? He blew up the fucking clown, okay? (laughs) Sir, Sir, question. Yes. I mean, wouldn't we also risk him getting mad again if we deny him service? Wouldn't that just put us back in the room? So like, they, they have... How about we just say he's not allowed to enter at all? Like, you just lock all the doors. It's just drive through only. He, he could <laughs> he could order, but like, like, and then it shows him in like, like armor plated Kevlar, like reaching with a pole, pre hold with the other end of the pole holding there his meal. <laughs> <laughs> just like, God. just like, uh, I I asked for verde sauce. We're so sorry. We're stay calm, stay calm. We're getting the verde <laughs> right now. We're, you need we're to sorry. get mad, okay? All right, just, just breathe, just breathe. You know what? Here's a tenner on me. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the guys like thanks. I mean, you got jam right. You better remember that. <laughs> <laughs> See, for me, I'd be like, I mean, if we up at a McDonald's, why is why is the Burger King giving me this? <laughs> I went to Taco Bell. Did Burger King see me over at Taco Bell? <laughs> yeah. Do they know? 
I knew it. They're all together. <laughs> <laughs> like there's like a support like neighborhood watch system for this guy exclusively only at fast food places. Like, and that's why they know. <laughs> <laughs> just like Bur- the guys over the Burger King, just like yeah, we we were missing the verde sauce, and just like the dudes at Burger King, just like son of a bitch, just like <laughs> get him over there now, and like they're just a dude like running with like sacks of whoppers, just like trying to hope to mitigate the situation, like hoping like I hope these whoppers keep them from blowing up, <laughs> <laughs> and he'd still blow up. If it was me, I'd still blow up. Like, no, nah, it's too late, man. He took your fucking time here. He just <laughs> they get him the whoppers, and he's just like. I'm a vegetarian. That's why I came to talk about <laughs> for the cheesy bean and rice burrito. <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> and like, it's uh, just the dude. That's and... how, so that's how the Impossible Whopper got created. <laughs> <laughs> and now we know. Oh, okay. See, Punk Rock Horror Podcast, diving into the past uh-huh. of everything. <laughs> diving into the issues you don't care about <laughs> oh my god of course if like it was true it would ha- be happening in the most like small like hodunk town in the middle of like oklahoma or ohio where some like big explosion go off the rest of the world and just be like eh i mean there's fucking nothing but wheat there so <laughs> <laughs> this state is pretty wheat <laughs> <laughs> oh i'm <laughs> uh, <just> kidding <laughs> Alrighty then um i think without a mind we can jump into something we love and hate yeah as i burp I'm literally introing that segment <laughs> So yeah, we're going to jump into something love and we love and hate. If, if you are new to the show in any sort of way and you haven't heard a I love you, or I love you, uh, something we love you. <laughs> if you haven't heard I, an a I love you today, we're going to tell you now, hey. I love you. I love you. We love you. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're new to the segment and you haven't heard it before, something love and hate, what we do is we pick something in the past day, week, or month that has happened in our perspectives or in our own private worlds, and we want to talk about it. We want to bring it to your ears, help relate to your ghouls, gals, creeps, mutants a little more, and just let you know that we're not completely dead on the inside, at least not yet, at least. Maybe. I was, Almost. that was redundant. That was redundant <laughs> on my end. Um, <laughs> but, all right, jumping into it. So, my hate, and this is going to set, I've already told you about it, Cody, so it might reset you off again, but... Oh, yeah. We're going to have to bring it back. You're going to have to bring it back. Oh, my God. So, recently, me and Lauren and Aaron decided to to brave the wild and go to Mills Mall over here in in Colorado. And if you're a Colorado native, you know what the Mills Mall is. If you've visited here and been to the Mills Mall, you know exactly what it is. And, yeah, it's a mall. That's the most obvious answer, but it is a huge-ass mall. Like... There's the Cherry Creek Mall, which is also very big in size. And this, like, either is is bigger or just, like, comes second to it. Um, So, like, I would estimate more than 80,000 square feet. You know, like, I'm not going to, like, sit here and get, like, accurate numbers. But, like, I'm I'm making this all detail known first and foremost. So, anyways, um, we we parked. It's huge. It's fucking huge. It takes takes about, like, 20, 30 minutes to get from end to end, I think. Some shit like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so what we did is, so we went to, we parked it in the Target parking lot because it's connected to a Super Target, and because that Super Target is still under like pandemic guidelines, not a lot of people use that parking lot, so it's just an easy place for us to park and get inside um, mm-hmm. because it connects the rest of the mall, right? And so. Um, we went and did our thing. We did a little shopping. You know, we didn't really eat. Like we we don't eat at the mall. We don't really eat at public places. We only order out. That part doesn't matter as much. But just kind of like you know, a normal day of what you would or somewhat normal day of what you would spend at a mall. And mm-hmm. so, um, as me, Lauren, and Aaron, you know, where we were walking out, um, we walked out of like the entrance doors, and we saw this kid kind of just like 
by himself. Well, I shouldn't say I shouldn't say we did. Lauren did because you know because she's a para and she's becoming a teacher. She's very aware of when kids are just kind of like walking around by themselves, and that <laughs> was this situation. So like, I didn't think anything at first because I saw like a group of people nearby, and I thought he, the kid, you know, they were his like family. Mm -hmm. um, but they kind of just like got up and left, and Lauren just noticed that this kid started walking you know, away by himself. And the kid, like, was probably, like, six or seven to kind of, like, paint uh, an idea of, like, how young he was. Mm -hmm. And so, like, he was, like, picking flowers, right, out of, like, the, the planters around outside. Um, and so she, you know, she goes up to talk to him and, you know, just tries to see, you know, what's, you know, what's going on and, and asks. And the kid, like, he isn't crying or anything, but Lauren finds out that his parents are somewhere in the mall right yeah and so he's so like if if this is kind of going over anybody's head already so basically just to sum it up we walked out of the target you know entrance and or what's next to the target entrance at least and so there was this kid who was by himself picking flowers with no adult supervision around at all now what lauren did and this is just another reason why i love her and i'm just you know i fall madly in love with her and and she would probably say the same thing about me, but I mean, I fart a lot, so you know, so take up the grain of salt. I mean, kidding, you, kidding. You can't, you can't say a sentence without burping sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, anyway, she starts, you know, talking to the kid, and I kind of see what he's doing, what what's going on. So I have I have Aaron with me, and so we walk over to to talk, and like we're we're not trying to crowd him, but like Aaron just like sits like next to Lauren, and I sit on the other side of the kid, and. You know, the kid's kind of like being a little, you know, like he doesn't want to talk. And so, like, you know, we don't know, you know, we don't know what's going on. For all we know, this kid could have autism and he could not have autism. You know, he could have a developmental disability in general. We don't know. Maybe that's the reason why he's not talking. So, you know, we are eventually able to get him to open up a little and ask him like, hey, you know, um, how, how's it going, big guy? You know, have you seen your parents? And so he was talking and saying, yeah, I, I, I came to get flowers for my mom and dad. And so, like, that was kind of, like, a hard moment because it's just, like, where the fuck is your mom and dad? And, like, I'm already fearing the worst. You know, I'm, like, paranoid that this kid was purposely left at the mall because the parents didn't want to be parents anymore. And that's just where my mind goes. You know, that's my paranoia. Yeah. That's just where it goes. And, and, and being a dad, too, I guess. Being a parent in general, I guess. And so... And he's like, you know, where, where did you go? And he, you know, where did they, were they? And he's like, oh, they, you know, they were at the shoe store. This kid doesn't know the name of the stores, you know? Mm -hmm. So like the fact that he could give that much detail was good. And so like, I know of, there's a few shoe stores in the Mills Mall, but there's one huge shoe store in the Mills Mall called Off Broadway. And that's the first one that came to my mind. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we talked to the kid and they're like, hey, well, how about we start walking towards where your parents were and let's see if we can find them. You know, obviously keeping an eye out for like security along the way um, as we walk through and keep it in mind, like, like I'm assuming he, the parents are at off Broadway, you know, and where off Broadway is in the in the mall as compared to uh, Target, because this is where we found the kid again was outside. Um, we saw that you, you, that he had to really get out of his parents like attention span or something like his he traveled and yeah, cause, that's cause, a good chunk of way. Yeah, because keep it in mind, this mall is definitely like probably a hundred, hundred thousand square feet more than that, maybe. And you know, he's he's off Broadway's on one side of the mall, where uh, Target on the completely other side with like a food court in the middle. And mm -hmm. so you know, it, like I was like, okay, well, we'll find the kid, parents' kids. And so we we made it back to off Broadway shoes and. Um, you know, before we even got there, we did find a security guard and let them know the situation. And so, like, they shouldn't have let us keep walking, but they were trusting of us. It was a weird situation. I'm not saying we made right calls or anything, but we did get to off Broadway shoes. And it was the dad... mostly more likely since you were parents, you know, since you had Aaron there. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, but, because that's still... what we tell Audrey. Like, if for whatever goddamn reason we get separated in public, we tell her, look for either someone who works there or parents mm -hmm. you know <laughs> yeah. 
And so, and like this kid though, I got to give him credit. He was a champ throughout the whole thing. He did not cry. He didn't break down. He was confused. You know, that's for sure. He had no idea what was going on. Couldn't comprehend the situation he was in. But like he, he like he kept it together. Like I thought, you know, he's he's a tough kid. He's a good kid. And so we eventually, you know, we're able to find the parents. And the dad was like, you know, he comes out. And he's like, oh, thank you for finding my son, you know. Or it's like, yeah, man. He's like, where, where, where is he? And we're like, he was all the way outside, almost going into the street. You know, I mean, I'm being a little exaggerated because he was picking flowers. But still, um, I was like, you know, he was all the way outside, dude. Nobody was looking after him. And so, like, and I kind of like, I shouldn't have done it. I really shouldn't have done it. But I kind of gave, got into him. And I was like, you need to keep a better eye on your kid, man. He was all the way near into the parking lot. Something could have happened to that kid. You are lucky we came across him. You're lucky my wife, who is a teacher and a fantastic mother and has this type of sixth sense, noticed this and picked up on it. You are beyond lucky. And like, I shouldn't like, I know some people are going to be like, yeah, you should have railed into him. I don't know. I felt like I crossed a certain boundary, but point being is just like it, it, my hate is that there is this like, and, and this is just me assuming it, but it seems like there is this, still this mentality of some parents out there who treat their kids as like a nuisance or an accessory. And I get it. Listeners, you're going to tell me, Matt, you know, as parents, you should understand it can be easy to lose a kid. And you're right. It can be easy. Lauren did once lose Aaron in TJ Maxx. It happened. But you know what she did? She went and talked to the clerks. She got people looking for Aaron, keeping their eyes open. And sure enough, within like 10 minutes, or actually maybe just less than that, they were able to find Aaron. You know, Aaron just got a little lost looking at clothes and didn't realize mom was walking it off. And so I get it. It can happen. But off-Broadway shoes being on the other side of the mall and then Target being on the completely other, other side, I mean... This dude didn't already talk to security because when we got to security, they had no idea this kid was missing. This was the first time we brought it to their attention. And so, like, I'm just like, and like, I don't know, maybe benefit the doubt. The dad, like, broke down and didn't know what to do and was freaking out. But still, at some point, like, I don't, it it just angers me because, like, it it, it just like, it's like, this is your fucking kid. You need oh, to keep yeah. an eye on him. And with, with how young he is and, you know, saying it, and whether or not he does or doesn't have a de- developmental disability, he, he's like six or seven. You know, he does. The, the mall is fucking huge. It is overwhelming. There are so many noises. There are so many people, so many lights, so many colors, everything happening at once. No wonder that kid's going to lose track and, you know get lost it is up to you to be on to the kids and here's the other thing like i know i make fun of them but legitimately parents that leash their kids you're the real mvps you know this shit was gonna happen and you got in front of it (laughs) (laughs) damn dude that's fucking crazy jesus like it's just just, like it just it bothers me like it boggles my mind and everything because like how do you lose your kid for that long and not be looking for him mm mm-hmm like he wasn't even looking for him. You found the parents exactly where that kid said they were gonna be, and like it took a good hot minute to get there too. Like so, how do you not? What? Find the, how were the parents not looking for him? How after that long, they, at least one of them didn't go to security. Yeah, I you know. And, like well, one who of knows them, how long you know he was lost. Exact, I mean, he, yeah, you've like, been in the Mills Mall, you know. Yeah. The Mills Mall is a quarter of, like, I forget, it takes, like, it's a quarter of a mile long, like, around. Yeah. Or some shit like that. Like, and then plus, like, I don't know, just in my head, I'm like, if I, okay, so say, for instance, like, me and Dev were out and somehow, and we had two kids and somehow we, somehow one did get away from us. It wouldn't take us 20, 30 minutes to realize that. It'd be less than two minutes, and if one, if we really couldn't find them, we a we would have had a plan with the. We always make a plan with the kids to begin with before we go anywhere. We're like, if we ever get separated, this is where we meet. This is who you talk to. Do not talk to anybody else. You do not go with anybody else. You do not leave here with anybody else. You oh, know. Yeah. If if I feel Aaron is starting to drift off, I will grab her by the shirt collar or like the sleeve. And, and I'll oh. remind her, I'm like, you need to stay close. Okay? Yeah, like, we grab stay it. Close. 
freaking uh, one time, the last time we all went to Target and shit, like Audrey was just like wanting to run off or wander off and stuff. And like, we are like, nope. And Dev took her to the car. <laughs> yeah. like, it's like, how do you not notice your kids gone, especially when they're six? Like, if you want <laughs> to take your kid to a public place that they can run around in, go to the daycare, get them in a daycare. Or, you know, what's another great place? A fucking playground. I mean, I get it. It's a pandemic and you're iffy about playgrounds and that's kind of, you know, up to the parents' discretion, but Jesus Christ, like I don't like <clears throat> excuse me, I can only keep assuming like this dude's mindset. Like my biggest fear, my biggest worry is that they were at off Broadway shoes and like the dad and the mom were just like looking at shoes and and Junior was just being too too much for them to handle and so they're like why don't you just like go run off and like or, or they maybe they wouldn't set it that way but they're like like not right now go keep yourself entertained something like that you know like yeah. i like and that's just me assuming 100 percent. that's me assuming i don't know if that's the case you know and i can't say that's the case but like th that's what i mean that's my biggest fear you mm -hmm. know like that is my biggest thing like me uh, like slightly personal like me and lauren are trying really hard to have a second child and then i see parents make stupid obvious mistakes like this mm -hmm. when you when you shouldn't be like like gee like there i'm i can't keep excusing bad or lackluster parenting like i can't no. keep doing that like and and i'm trying not to make excuses for this dude and i'm trying to play like devil's advocate but at the same time i'm just like fucking it's your kid dude it is your kid that that should come before your wallet <laughs> that should be the thing you're looking for before <laughs> your phone you know, like, like, where it's is this a, other it's a living being that you it's created? A, it's a fucking person, dude. Like, yeah, it, like, and I just like, like, I uh, like, I'm just like, you're a fucking breeder. That's all you are. You are a mindless breeder. And it drives me insane. And you're <laughs> you're the reason why we're going to get Hitler point two. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe not that extreme. But, like... <laughs> but yeah, just fucking please keep an eye on your kids. Like I'm assuming all of our listeners who have parents are responsible, good parents and know already to do that. Parents. I hope you have parents. Yeah. But just, <laughs> but if you are a parent and you listen to the show, just a reminder, always double check, make sure you got your kid by your side, make sure you got a system because God forbid what would have happened if Lauren didn't pick that kid out. Got like, like yeah. my mind race public place. Yeah. Like I, like, that oh, sorry I'm like i'm trying to calm down because like uh, so, the thought of how easily he could have been abducted is like really is what ticks me off about it like but sure. i just yeah okay anyways let's palette cleanse yeah, yeah palette cleanse let's clean clean the anger yes. with something we love it's something we love <laughs> so, I got something if you want me to kick it off or if you want to kick it off buddy because I kicked off the hate um you feel free to yeah, no, I'll kick it off. Uh, the thing I love, honestly, it was fucking Godzilla versus Kong. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. It's good. It was fucking good. It was exactly what I wanted. The right monster won. I'm not gonna spoil that. But oh like, no! Like, come on! Like, it's obvious. Like, if you don't know, like, <laughs> it's it's so they teased it no, at no, like the end no. of like Godzilla King of Monsters. Like, you know who it's gonna be. Like, I know, but still, like, there's still those things that just came out. <laughs> like, like, okay, but, but okay. That, so but what I will, thing, sorry, go like, ahead, go ahead. Say, the thing that I liked about this movie, unlike what they did with like Batman versus Superman and even Civil War, is that there was an actual winner between the two. So that's one thing I really liked about this movie before, you know, Mecha Godzilla shows up, which, yes, that I mean, that's not a spoiler. That was literally shown in the trailers and everything like Mecha Godzilla is going to come out and oh, everyone thought... is going to show up. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. I thought you were saying like, that's what you didn't want to spoil. Oh, no, that not that. I'm talking <laughs> about they the difference between Kong, King Kong versus Godzilla is that there's an actual winner between Godzilla and King Kong. They actually have an ending to their fight. So that's what I liked about it. And I don't want to spoil the ending of that fight. <laughs> I mean, I, I think <laughs> it is kind of an ending. I, I don't know. Like, I won't. There's one, one it part. It literally died. One of them literally died and had to get defibrillated back to life to help the other with Mega Godzilla. Oh, that's a good point. I did forget about that. That is a good yeah. point. Yeah. 
So there's an actual winner. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what However, I like. I will it. say it was really badass when they teamed up to take oh, on Mega yeah. Godzilla, and one grabbed thing. one arm, the other grabbed the other arm, and just like plowed him through that tower. I was just like, <laughs> "Fuck <laughs> yeah! This is the WWE I invested in. Why is this better? <laughs> this is all I wanted out of a Godzilla versus King Kong movie. Like, I was like, "Fuck the people. Who cares about the people? Because like once again, <laughs> like I saw an, uh, the biggest fucking critique, and I went, okay, one thing." comicbook.com y'all suck i'm sorry i did you're the worst reviewed ever and anything and i don't know why you show up in my feed so much i hate you so much but anyways because you're just you're in my opinion you're part of the problem with what's wrong with the toxic geek culture um anyways if you actually work for comicbook.com i'm sorry that you work for a terrible place anyways <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but like they, they, a lot of the reviews are like, oh my god, there's not enough human drama. Like I don't care about the people and blah blah blah. I'm like fuck the people. I'm going into a kaiju movie to watch a kaiju fight. Yeah. Like you know what? Like, I don't care. Like cool, Millie Bobby Brown. I love you. This is pr and like and it's cool that you're in this series. But like, I'm not watching this for you. <laughs> yeah like... and like to be fair we've made the case for like the human aspect of the godzilla movies before and why it's important but yeah. like th that only plays like a smaller part as part of this movie like yeah they needed to have people in, in camps for both king kong and godzilla within the movie but like yeah i mean it was it was all about the monsters throwing down like that's everybody wanted to see that's what everybody yeah. wanted to like experience is like how brutal is it gonna get like how like and just again dude like i feel like there was far more action scenes than there were human scenes to be oh, quite honest for sure and it was awesome and they were like the right amount of like paste too and length in my opinion like they didn't stay too long they didn't get too crazy i mean like of course yes they got crazy it's fucking a giant radioactive lizard fighting a gorilla that somehow in five years sprung several hundred feet taller <laughs> I, I have to say though like because i was watching the movie and i was just like i was like like you can't critique this movie in a traditional way because if you do yeah. then yeah it's going to come out with a low score yeah. like because there is a lot of issues with it so what is the overall point of this movie it's an Avengers movie. It's just meant to be a fun, good time. What people want to see is just their heroes, in this case, Kaiju, team up and beat the shit out of each other and then team up again. You know? Yeah, exactly. All we wanted to see is just giant monsters beating the fuck out of other giant monsters. And they're like, all right, this is what you want. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, yeah! Like, <laughs> like it's yeah, essentially so what a lot of people wanted with, you know, the first Transformers movie. And then they just like overdid it and then just, you know. Yeah, I mean, it was the boobs aspect that kind of ruined Transformers for me. But <laughs> like, sure there was a lot of boobs. Like, like OK, like. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah no. like, I, was, I, I didn't want to pull a, an Andrew Jackson type moment, so I didn't want to go into it. I'm not going to. So. Yeah, okay. Yep. <laughs> I caught myself this time. <laughs> but like, yeah, no, that's what like ruined with the Transformers is that like they didn't do focus enough on the actual like robot fights. They try to add too much drama and boobs in it and stuff because Michael Bay. And then with this one, they're like, you just want giant monsters fighting each other. Yes, that's why I want to go watch a Godzilla movie. OK. <laughs> like, yeah, it was that's good. Literally what they did. They're like, OK. And it was awesome. But that, oh, and Invincible. I've been watching that. <laughs> yeah. And so y'all want to get your, if God's, Godzilla versus Kong, like, is, like, where you want to start off, like, with your brutality of, like, you know, pretty tame brutality because it's PG-13 type stuff. And you want to get that, like, visceral shit, go watch Invincible. Holy crap, that show is good. <laughs> like, like however i will say the one thing that i feel is going to annoy the shit out of me because i know it's going to happen is that there's going to be a bunch of people that come out and be like well it's just the animated version of the boys and it's going to like throw my nerd rage into override because i'm like first first uh yeah first of all completely different art uh, uh like writers in general robert kirkman and garth ennis although <laughs> may share similar themes both of them are completely different when it comes to execution. Robert oh, Cookman yeah. made The Walking Dead, 
and Garth Ennis made uh, Crossed. Walking Dead was more popular, but Crossed was far more brutal. Um, you know, like it. it so, and also, in my opinion, Robert Kirkman does better with the underlying storytelling and messages than Garth mm-hmm. Ennis. Like, not not te- not taking no, 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 no. anything well, away from. But Garth that's my Ennis. point. Like, that's Robert my point. Kirkman does better with that. And yeah. then also, for one, Invincible came first, and two. Invincible is more, it would be more along the lines of take the Justice League and put it into reality. Mm-hmm. That's what I get from Invincible. The boys is take corporate America and just give them superpowers. Right. Like, you know what but, I mean? They create. But somebody it. could easily come back and argue, be like, well, that's what would happen if you made Justice League, Justice League and put it in reality. And like, my, my whole thing about it is that the difference is in the creativity itself. If you're yeah. basing it all, like, like, nobody has it, and I'm only making a hypothetical argument towards something that I feel is going to happen. So this it, is literally an argument in my head that I created that hasn't happened. Exactly. <laughs> but I can't see it happening. And I feel like it will happen when like season three of the boys comes out or, you know, and, and, and they talk about it. But again, I could be wrong. It's not like it's the biggest deal if I'm right or wrong in either way in this regard. But I just, I just, like I said, it's just going to send my nerd rage into yeah. overdrive. If that happens, I'm like, it's the same fucking thing. It's like yeah, comparing you know, Star Trek and Star Wars purely because they're sci-fi. Oh yeah, no, seriously. I mean, like, and again, also with Invincible, you're fo- you're mostly following the tale of Invincible, while in the boys, you're following a group. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> like yes, he just uh, does join a group or whatever, and you start following and caring about other people. But the boy point of the boys is you're not just following Huey and the butcher. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's about an anti-terrorist terrorist group. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then Invincible is about superheroes. The just end. very brutal <laughs> ah, well with that being said I think we can finally move on to the meat of the show and uh, go into our movie reviews yeah so I know you went first last time so I did I, I can go first this time um, but we so we we are kind of changing these up a little bit Cody do you want to introduce why or explain why we're changing it up a little bit yeah so uh with this, uh, with our two movie reviews this time, we kind of decided to change things up by sen- seeing as how Robert Maudsley is the inspiration for Hannibal the Cannibal, and also we've been doing a quite a bit of cannibals. <laughs> we kind of wanted to change things up a little bit, and instead we, and also a big reason, the biggest reason we wanted to do this is also standing uh, to keep uh, keep standing in line with the tradition uh, with what's going on in the world with. Uh, bringing in line the whole uh um i'm sorry you know that you know the line better yeah. so, so you go ahead so basically um to, to start showing our support in in our way we what go. we can do for showing solidarity against uh a- against asian hate in america in the world right now um, there we go we, <laughs> we, you could no, say you're okay, better you're okay. than me <laughs> okay. um we decided to review uh movies that were made uh not just by asian directors but that do come from uh the asian part uh, I'm, now i'm tripping on my own Coming words from asia mostly we yes decided due to asian films that were done by asian directors and to still keep in line with the fact that we reviewed uh serial killer they are serial killer movies and the um, reason but, we're doing sorry I say, but we mostly wanted to make sure that you know we wanted to bring light because these are two amazing movies coming from two amazing um, Asian directors, and they're both like in two very amazing Asian made movies. You know, like and to, some of the best movies. Like this, I'm excited to talk about mine. It's probably in my top five now of like <laughs> so, Korean films. And, and to kind of expand on that a little more too, so. Our next Tuesday episode as well is we're going to be joined with Crystal again. And we're actually going to be diving into the history of Asian horror cinema in two parts. First, starting with uh, 1950s up to the 1970s and then 1980. And then in our part two, we'll focus on the 1980s up to the modern era. And we're going to talk about the history and influence of Asian horror cinema, cinema, excuse me, in the realm of horror, how it's influenced horror and how it's also changed a lot of parts of horror as well. Because first of all, um, we did do this last year as well uh, in order to stand with solidarity with black light, with the black lives movement. Um, And if we're going to do this again, 
you know, and it's sad because of what's happening. We wish, you know, when you kind of talked about it, we kind of realized, you know, we wish we were doing this out of better times in the world and not um, the fact that this is happening. But to show our solidarity in the Poker Core podcast way, we are going to review movies, like we said, that do uh, come from Asian directors with an Asian cast. And again, coming Tuesday, we will dive into the history of these uh, directors as well and how it's shaped the realm of horror and then follow up with more movies that are in that regard as well. We will still stay within theme of what the theme is on, of course. That being said, you know, even Cody just talked on about the fact that we did talk with Robert Maudsley about Robert Maudsley with Emily McGinnis herself. Again, shout out to her and her husband, Dan. They're super friendly, amazing people. Make sure you check out the zombie game. Um, but yeah, that's why we're doing this. So please keep in mind, we are trying to keep it in good taste and just trying to do it the punk rock horror podcast way. Um, and again, just as just a side note, people, please take care of each other. Stand next to each other. Advocate for each other. Fight for each other. Um, we only fail as a species when we're divided and we lose all empathy for one another. Um, so, that being said... And fuck racism. Like, seriously. <laughs> it's 2021. God damn it. Be punk done with it. For fuck's fuck. sakes. But we already got past something we love and hate, so let's try not to regress too exactly. much. Exactly. Just fuck racism. Fuck racism <laughs> and always punch a Nazi. Always punch a Nazi. Always punch a Nazi. There's never a bad time to punch a Nazi. I hope I get a punch a Nazi on my wedding day. <laughs> <laughs> I will <laughs> capture be, a Nazi just for you. Bring it to your wedding day so you can do ever. it. <laughs> like, he's a Nazi! Yeah! Deck it! Get, get us what's <laughs> in the cake. Here's a chainsaw. <laughs> like, I could recreate Captain America number one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyways, so I will jump into to my movie. So mine is a fantastic, not completely surprising, but still very, very good uh, Japanese horror film revolving around a serial killer called Creepy. Came out in 2016 and is directed by Kiyoshi Kurosawa, written by Yutaka Mikawa and Chihiro Ikita stars Hiritoshi Nishijima, Yuko Takeuchi, and Toru Baba. Um, what the movie itself is about is that Takakura is a former directive who ev eventually ends up... Re de oh, said corrected. I said, I said corrective. Detective. My bad. <laughs> former detective. He receives a request from his ex-colleague, Nogami, to start examining a missing family case that occurred six years earlier. However... Takura eventually ends up becoming obsessed with the case himself and soon to suspect that his neighbor might have been involved with what happened with the family from six years ago. So I will just tell dun, you. Dun, dun, dun. Dun. So there's a lot of good about this movie, obviously. That's why we're reviewing it. However, <laughs> the biggest thing I'm going to tell all of you listeners is that it is a bit of a slow paced movie. I'm going to get into how that affects the movie, but just be aware of that right now. First and foremost, though, uh, the movie itself does a great job at foretelling the theme of the movie and what we're going to be experiencing with our protagonist, Takakura, played by Hiditoshi, uh, Nish, uh, excuse me, Nishijima, uh, talking to his class about the rise of serial killers in the modern age. He's, you know, he talks about, he kind of goes over an overview of just like how how we you know the fbi started to find patterns even with serial killers who were you know didn't have a pattern what they can look for um and what i thought was really funny but like i was like i shouldn't have had a usa moment about it but i totally did it like they mentioned that a majority of it a majority of the rise of serial killers came from the u.s and i was like <laughs> we're number one we're number, we're number one. one. USA. We like to kill. USA. We like to kill. <laughs> I was like, I shouldn't be proud of that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. I'm not. We used to be proud of Colorado being the. It was, just, it was just a weird moment, but I was like, <laughs> well, I was just like, yeah, suck it, Europe. <laughs> <laughs> we kill ourselves. <laughs> All your jokes about it are true. <laughs> I'm depressed. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go take a drink now. <laughs> but yeah, so like he like 
it's so yeah so go back to it um so it really does a good job at like foretelling you know what signs to look out for as the movie plays on in uh takakura mr takakura gets more obsessed um with uh with uh nishino throughout and i'll talk about nishino here in a moment um but the movie especially in the beginning is a bit of a slog now i'm gonna tell y'all right now ghouls gals creeps and mutants that is this is not a horror movie for somebody who's wanting intense scares tons of gore you know non-stop action if you were hoping that this is will be that type of movie it's not going to be and you might be let down if you go in with that expectation however just because it is slow and if it can feel like a slog at some parts doesn't mean it still doesn't have its value um going more into it uh teruyuki kagawa as nishino who plays the creepy neighbor himself does a great job feeling each scene with an unnerving dread by not just how the way he walks, but also how he interacts with the world around him. I'm not going to say that like, it's a tit for tat, you know, Anthony Hopkins, you know, playing Hannibal Lecter, but it is very, it, it holds a good homage to it. It holds a good flame to, you know, unnerving serial killer, like, or just creepy characters who are, just dreadful and you know make you feel awkward as a viewer and i gotta say you know teruyuki did great excuse me i'm bourbon <laughs> it's okay but he did he did he does so good in the movie like you forget he's an actor he is that good at just filling this role and just being utterly what the title is creepy like every scene he is in it is so unnerving you don't know if he's gonna like snap you don't know if the person he's talking to is gonna snap you just don't know what's gonna happen he's just so unnerving and so with this movie being subtitles and, and the, i i don't know if there is a dub out for it i don't think there is even with subtitles it still just was really good at bringing in that type of dread and so him alone really makes this movie and i really recommend you invest in it especially if you love your serial killer movies whether they are fact or based on fact or fiction um you know if if you are all about true crime this is right up your alley purely for nishino's character alone um and a majority of the movie does focus on mainly character development and interaction which again might be a turn off for viewers who are wanting something more shocking or fast-paced because there are scenes where just like you know um nishino is at you know the takakura's home talking with mr and miss takakura about just like how good the food is and just like setting up this character you know like and setting up for what to expect throughout the movie and with it being a little over two hours i can definitely see where like some viewers might need to take a break in between again though just stick with me because this movie is still worth your time um going back into it so Harun Kawaguchi plays Saki, who is the survivor of uh, the family that, you know, went missing six years prior. She was the sole survivor of that incident. And she does a fantastic job without without pandering to the viewer as uh, the survivor working to help connect dots to what happened to her and her family. And what I really applaud her for and what I applaud the movie for is that they include the dialogue of like how detectives who are working on cold cases just like also like to play mind games or would do what they what is perceived as playing mind games with victims who are just trying to move on in their life now of course i can't speak for uh, surviving victims but i think it was really important that they show this perspective and they should put it under that type of scrutiny because they you don't really see that you know you don't really see when you hear about cold cases coming to light and you hear that you know a survivor comes back to help catch the crook um you know, the, you can you can imagine they'll talk about it somewhat, but this movie does a really good job at just like showing that and showing those nuances and showing how how rough and just trying it can be on a visual. So again, uh, Haran Kawaguchi as Saki, just so good. She's fantastic and you just feel so bad for her throughout the movie. Like she really, <laughs> oh, she but she, that, she, <laughs> just that, like oh that, me. Oh but, no. Uh, <laughs> but no, like, for real like you feel bad for her like she sells the role she's fantastic mm -hmm. like so i just tip my hat to her um and nushino uh, uh, excuse me nushino uh just does not let up throughout the movie with always being so unnerving so as the movie does progress and we see mr takakura talking with saki and trying to figure out you know how to connect these dots and how to you know find the killer you know his neighbor is just getting increasingly creepy throughout you know 
you know, he comes up to, you know, eventually at some point, um, Nishino comes up to Mr. Takakura and says, hey, your wife is a nuance, uh, is a nuisance, and she is bugging me. You need to do something. Even though in a scene prior, um, you know, Nishino was happy to talk to, you know, Mrs. Takakura and was very, you know, ha- nice to see her and, like, was asking her to come over and stuff. And so you see that he's, like, starting to, like, weave his way through into the psyche of not just Mr. Takakura, but also Miss Takakura. Um, and so as the movie does, you know, go continue on, I will say the twist isn't very hard to see coming, um, especially when you get to the middle of the film. You could kind of figure it out early on that Mr. Nishino was involved with the family disappearing. The mm-hmm. case that uh, Mr. Takakura is obsessed with. Like, it, if you've ever seen a serial killer movie, hell, if you've ever seen a horror movie, hell, if you've ever seen a TNT thriller movie, <laughs> like, it's no. It's not- <laughs> like it's not going to catch you off guard i mean like you're, you're gonna see it come from a mile away um so that kind of is a con i don't make it the biggest con because this movie makes it apparent that it does not rely on the twist um and so with that in mind as mr takakura gets more obsessed with mr nishino throughout the movie we also get to see that you know mr nishino is just kind of a monster. I mean, he's even described as such by one of the neighbors when uh, Nogami, one of uh, Mr. Takakura's friends, you know, goes to talk to the neighbor about Mr. Nishino. Um, the neighbor is just like, he's a monster. Stay away from him for the most part. And, you know, you get to see that in a similar way with Mr. Takakura, again, just like hunting down Saki and just like grabbing her by the arms and pushing her against the wall and be like, I need answers. Have you seen this man showing a pister picture of Mr. Nishino? So like you can kind of see that he, the more he gets obsessed with Mr. Nishino and seeing if Mr. Nishino is connected, um, we get, you begin to see him lose his empathy for human suffering because all he mm-hmm. wants is just the answers. He just wants answers. That's all it is that he cares about. Um, and so when the movie finally, finally starts to pivot into a little more intense type of, uh, atmosphere is when Shino finally just like is breaking through to Mrs. Takakura because throughout the movie, he's, he's mentally fucking with her. Um, you know, he's, he's trying to weave his way in to get her to think that she wants to leave Mr. Takakura and that she wants to be like, he's, it's like a really advanced version of like, like brainwashing, and mm-hmm. like some Stockholm syndrome. So I will say that, you know, trigger warning for that in that regard for anybody who gets upset at those type of scenes, or that might be triggering for you. Just keep that in mind. That's in this movie. Um, and what's so terrifying about him is that he knows how to mentally drain and exhaust a person in order to manipulate them to do what he wants. Um, so Yasuko, the wife of Mr. Takakura, um, we just see her continually get drained by him. And like, there's one scene where he says something to hear to her that the viewer can't hear and is not supposed to. And she just snaps and she's like, leave me alone. I'm going home, you know, leave me alone. And then he goes up to her and grabs her by the hand and holds it so gently um, like a sir. And it's just like, will you please come over tomorrow? I'll expect you tomorrow. You're coming over tomorrow. And it's such an uncomfortable, unnerving scene that, sells even more of like why this movie is worth your time um eventually you know getting to the end of this movie um getting to the climax of it which i thought about you know doing a whole spoiler warning but i i can still talk about the ending without really spoiling anything um because <laughs> it, it, it's going to come to a logical conclusion but it's how it executes it that matters so okay. um you do kind of find out that at some point that Mr. Nishino or who the man who's pretending to be at least, um, because again, he's a monster, um, was able to get the daughter that he supposedly has, which isn't actually his daughter to kill her own family. And the house that he's living in is that family's house. And so like, he does this fucked up way of just like continually poisoning them and drugging his victims until they are unconscious. And then he puts them, if he doesn't shoot them or kill them outright or get them killed, um, he puts them in a plastic bag of one of those seal bags that you can vacuum all the air out of and just seals them into it 
And so it's it's fucked up and it's so dark and it's just like it sits comfortably with, you know, how fucked up and how much of the uh, of the boundaries that Japanese horror can push. And so eventually we do get to our final confrontation where Mr. Takakura, you know, ends up shooting Mr. Nishino. And I'm not going to tell you how it happens, but it is such a weird, unnerving like after effect of that because mm-hmm. at this point yakuso and um and the little girl you know were so just brainwashed and under stockholm syndrome of mr Yoshino's abuse that it even takes yasuko a moment to come out of the daze and when the shock finally hits her she just breaks down and cries in the arms of mr takakura i swear i'm not trying to cry i'm burping again and that's why it <laughs> sounded fucking weird um so when when you get to the end of this movie, I mean, you you know, you're going to be like, OK, wow, this is this was a pretty slow movie. But holy shit, this ramp up and get fucked up out of nowhere. Um, Now I'm going to tell you all in no way is it like as fucked up as like audition. No, it's not anywhere near <laughs> close to that. But it does still hold the candle on its own. And with showing themes of Stockholm syndromes, creepies, scare factor plays on the thought of do we really know our neighbors? Although with although slow with easy to see, with an easy to see twist, creepy not only plays on homage and not not only pays homage to movies like Silence of the Lambs, but also succeeds at putting its own stamp on the genre when it comes to serial killers. And honestly, again, if you love serial killer movies, if you like if you love Silence of the Lambs, if you are a true crime fan, this movie is up your alley one hundred percent, and I strongly recommend that you go and you watch it because you are going to walk away after the two hour and ten minute runtime of just like <laughs> of a what the fuck did I just witness type of moment. Um, there's only one interesting fact for the movie, which is that the serial killer that the main character discusses with his class is Robert Hansen. He would kidnap prostitutes and take them in his plane into the forest where he would hunt them down and kill them. He lived in Alaska. So that is the one interesting fact about it. Um, if you want to, <laughs> I, I wish there was more. Like, uh, I know. I just think it's funny. I was like, oh, that's a future subject on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just taking notes down. Just like, <laughs> oh, no, I actually already had him. I have him lined up. Um, if if you wanted to check out creepy it is on pluto tv and to be for free it is on amazon prime with a subscription i was able to watch it with just the amazon amazon prime subscription itself so keep that in mind it's not like it's on shutter exclusively so it is widely available on amazon does not require that type of subscription at least hopefully by the time you're listening to this still doesn't um, it is also on iTunes and Apple TV at four ninety nine. Um, again, check it out. It still sits on a comfortable ninety percent Rotten Tomatoes. When I watched this movie, I didn't even I wasn't even aware of the rating of it. Um, check it out. It is fantastic. Again, creepy twenty sixteen. Not to be mistaken with Creep one and two, is its own movie. Check it out, Ghouls, Gas, Creeps, Man. It's just it's good. Like it's slow, but it is a good horror serial killer movie. Nice man, yeah. I'm, that, I'm gonna check that one out. <laughs> I like, I like the uh, Japanese serial killer movies. They're a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty nuts. Yeah, no, that was a good review. I'm excited. I like that. I, and also, you know me, I like my slow burns. <laughs> yeah, this this will definitely deliver the slow burn. Nice. All right, so. I'm super excited to talk about my movie. This is one that's been on like my to watch list for a very, very, very long time. I would also (laughs) say that this is technically kind of one of the more popular movies that we've ever done. It's Um, true. That is true. Like, I feel like it's probably fallen off the wayside in recent years just because like it came back, came out in 2010. But it, it probably is like, I think, one of the more popular ones we've done. Yeah, and it is getting more of a rise in it. Like, it's definitely gotten to that point where, like, if you've seen it, you know about it type of deal. Mm-hmm. But if you haven't seen it, it is, it is a trip for you to still check out. So it yeah. still sits in a weird kind of gray area of, of popularity. So it's depending like, on, yeah, on where you almost, come from. It's almost a cult hit, but almost too popular to be a cult hit. 
So, but it works for the show. Maybe. I don't know. I'm saying it works for the show because I want to talk about it anyways. <laughs> and it fits Go for the it. Go for it. So, um, I'm doing 2010's I Saw the Devil. Um, I really hate IMDb's thing about it. So, I'm, I'm going to make up my own. Basically, a man is seeking revenge on a serial killer who brutally, kill, who brutally murders his wife. And he seeks revenge and uh, more, more brutal tactics. So, <laughs> brutal. yeah, brutal. And that's and that is going to be the word of the review is brutal because this brutal. movie does not hold punches. Holy fuck! Anyway, so um, it stars uh, uh, starring. I'm just going to name these t- these two dudes because they're the most popular and like it's really cool. So uh, Lee Byung Hun as uh, Kim uh, as Kim Officer Kim and Cho uh, Choi Min Sik as Jang. And if you that name sounds a little familiar as I didn't butcher it uh, totally 100 uh, percent. That guy, he plays old uh, the original old boy. <laughs> like so it's really cool seeing the protagonist of old boy come back and be the bad guy. So it's really, it's sweet. So if you saw that movie, you know what you're in for, for this movie. Um, It was directed by Ji Woon Kim. Um, It was written by Park Hoon Sung and Ji Woon Kim. And yeah. So this movie, it starts off like it almost starts off as like a, it's going to lead into a slow burn, but it is not. This is a two, like an over two hour movie of just non stop, like intensity. Like just, you're on the, oh my God, I could, like, my heart was pounding this entire movie. <laughs> like, and so it starts off like, it almost starts off with the whole like slow movie feel. Um, because like you just see your, our main protagonist, Kim, talking to his wife on the phone. And uh, his wife's uh, car broke down and she's telling him that, like, I'm just waiting for the, you know, like, I'm waiting for the tow truck, but it's not, I just want to talk to you while I'm waiting for them. And then this uh, student, like a student bus, I don't know, I get, okay, so I guess where they, where they are, like, it's almost like a school bus, but it also, it takes just students everywhere. It doesn't have to be from school. Like, I guess it's Mm. like a student transportation thing. I don't know. That's what it said on there. Anyway, the so magic that, school bus. Okay. Yeah, basically, okay. <laughs> the magic kill bus. Um, so yeah, that pulls up, and uh, the guy oh, gets uh. Kill bus. Okay, I'm sorry. Yep. Do, 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 do. <laughs> the guy gets out of the van, and he comes up to the to the car, and she just like kind of cracks her window because she's sit, sitting in the car. It's snowing outside, so it's like super cold out. Of course, she wants to sit in her car, um, and he's like. Uh, do you need any? He asks if she needs any help. She's like, Oh, I'm just, I have a flat. I'm waiting for a tow truck. And so the guy like walks around. She's still on the phone with her husband and he's like, What's going on? And she's like, Oh, this guy's trying offering to help and stuff. And he's like, Just tell him you're waiting for the tow truck. I already paid for the fucking thing. Just wait for the tow truck. Like he's telling her, like, Just don't worry about it. And so she ends up telling the guy, like, hey, uh, I'm waiting for a tow truck. Like, thank you for being super nice and checking on me, but it's okay. Like, you don't, I'm fine. And he was like, and so the guy was like, are you sure? Like, you're going to probably get buried by the time the tow truck gets here. Like, I can just give you a lift to the closest place and blah, blah, blah. She's like, no, don't worry. Like, I'm fine. He's like, okay. And so he like walks away and uh, right after she and so she like, you know, they talk and stuff a little bit longer on the phone and then she hangs up and then right when she hangs up, uh, he like pans over and you just see the guy who was talking to her just has this giant lead pipe and just fucking goes ape shit at the front of her fucking car and freaks her out. And so then he busts open her car window and then climbs in there and just brutally like it shows it, man, just beats her fucking head in. Jesus. with like yeah and it's brutal <laughs> like again where did the where did the set where did the review brutal um and he just fucking beats her head in with a hammer and then he get and so and then dr- you see him dragging her body through the snow and then he drag and then she, he uh shows him in his like kill shack and she's all naked and everything and he has her all tied up in his kill shack and she find and so she uh, is finally able to talk and she goes, please don't kill me. I'm pregnant. <laughs> like, 
And oh he's just God. like, and the guy just goes, oh, and fucking just goes ape shit, starts hacking there to pieces, dude. And it oh shows God. all of it. Like this, fuck, it's a blood 10 out of 5. <laughs> this movie is so goddamn bloody and it's and it's all in like the way it needs to be it's like, like it's such a visceral movie and so it shows him do all this stuff like hack her to pieces put her body parts in like in like in this like bucket and stuff like that it shows him literally clean his kill house and everything and but what he did what he didn't realize is that her wedding ring falls off of her finger and and it goes down one of the drains, but it doesn't go fully down the drain. So foreshadowing, because that's what Korean uh, Korean horror does really really good with is foreshadowing. Mm-hmm. And so she and so after all this, <laughs> some poor kid is just like finds this plastic bag in the middle of a field and opens it and just sees a fucking ear and freaks the fuck out. <laughs> As one would. So, yes, and so that's how, and so the cop and the cops like get called and everything. There's this giant me- like fucking media search party for like for what's going on, and when they finally find the head, like this, I got so agitated because the- one of the cops finds her head and he just goes, "Oh my god, we found it! We found the head!" Like screaming it as loud as he can, and so of course all the media is like swarming around her head, taking pictures and shit like that. <laughs> It's like this is why we don't invite you to this anymore, Dave. Yeah, and then the fucking and then Dave is carrying the box with a head in it and just fucking trips and drops the head and it rolls out. (laughs) Like you're you're laughing at this, and and that's how Kim finds out it was his wife because her roll her head rolls out into the middle of a field and he sees it. (laughs) No one told him his wife's dead. That it was God his wife. God damn it, Dave. <laughs> yeah. God, God damn it. So D- Dave fucked everything up for Kim. <laughs> um, yeah, so it shows this. And then this is where a, more of the slow burn kind of comes into. But don't worry. <laughs> like, it slows down for... There's more. Yeah, it slows down for just a quick second. Just a quick second. And then it just... Whew. So... Um, the reason why I actually like this slowdown is because it uh, this movie really focuses on the emotions of the family. And so it shows all of them grieving. Like it shows Kim grieving at the funeral and everything and t- and like just how like he's going through the motions. And it shows her uh, his wife's family grieving, his father in law, his sister in law, like how badly this really hurt them all and everything. And our guy, and then I also like one thing that I like is that the the force that he's on the police force is his agent force. Um, they are actually telling him to take months off. They're like, you take as much time as you want, dude. What do you want? Four, four months, two months, four months. And he's like, I just want my two weeks. And they're like, what? And he's like, I just need two weeks. Like that's all I want. And so, like, all right, fine, we'll see you in two weeks, but don't fucking do anything. Um, and so right after that, this, uh, the movie starts picking up. And so this is where like, you kind of see more of like what Kim's, uh, past it or what his job is. So him and his father-in-law, his father-in-law actually gives him four poten- uh, four potential serial killers that they are, that the police for police are watching, but they don't have any solid concrete proof to arrest them. And so they're like, they all have the same MO of her death. <laughs> and so they're like all right cool they're gonna get started on this shit and so this is where the movie just starts picking the picks up and does not let off the gas so kim find goes to his first serial killer <laughs> mm. so he catches the dude jerking off to porn and so he turns off the dude's like uh he unplugs the guy's like porno right as he's about to finish and pisses the guy off because he's like ah, uh, uh, what the fuck <laughs> he's about to hoe face and he turns around and sees Kim swinging the cord he bitch slaps him with it and then chokes him out and so this dude's just like pantsless and it just get the shit kicked out of him Kim does straight face doesn't give a fuck and so he starts interrogating the guy and he shows him a picture of like where the uh of his wife and like the kill scene just like the the murder scene where his wife was kidnapped and so he's just like 
is this were you here the other day have you been here like recently and stuff like that and the dude's crying he's telling him no and kim's like all right i believe you walks away and then you just see the shot of like the fucking dude freaking the fuck out and kim comes in with a monkey wrench and it shows it and he just beats this dude's testicles in just too good whack whack <laughs> And I was just like, oh my god, they showed it. <laughs> they really and, did it. Yep, they really did it. They really did it. Um, and so they show that, and then the guy confesses to killing two, that he's actually a serial killer pedophile. So he's in the hospital and he confesses. So it's almost like like Robert Maudsley, Kim's kill like fucking people up who deserve it, <laughs> you know. And so, mm-hmm. and the second guy that he gets, he just fucking hits him with a car. <laughs> like it just shows Kim driving, and then he just sees this, sees the guy, and he just runs him down with the car, and then just kicks the living shit out of the guy in this alleyway. Like that's all that happens to the dude. He like shows him. He's like, you know, I'm guessing he interrogates him off screen, but like in the shot, it is just super fucking funny and quick, because like the dude's just sit there on his bike, and you just see Kim, and he just drives, hits him, and then he just starts kicking the shit out of him afterwards. Like it's really fucking great. You know? <laughs> so, so overt brutality aside, what else sells this movie? Because I'm already sold. <laughs> But yeah. for all of our other okay. listeners. So, yeah, I just and and so after here, uh one thing that I actually do like, uh, they kind of like break conventional type things because you know they say here's the four potential serial killers, and usually in movies they find them on the last one. Um they act he actually figures it out from the uh figures it out who it is after this one. Um he's looking at the dude's face. And so this is where uh it start again, the brutality, like it'll start going to brutality and everything from there but i'm not going to go into that but the, uh, it actually does the uh actually sorry i have to go into one more super brutal thing it actually pans over to our serial killer and it shows him do his second kill uh of the movie and he convinces a girl and uh he ends up and, like he just talks to her and uh he convinces her to give her a ride and then again it shows him uh shows him do this he like pulls he's trying to find his weapon but she doesn't realize it and he ends up once he finds it, he pulls over, beats her head in, and it t- shows him take her to his fucking kill room and guillotines her, like with an actual guillotine that he made. And so that's like showing into just like the character comparison, because that's the whole thing about this movie is that you start comparing. It's it's trying to compare these two characters, as in Kim, who's doing all these brutally things to like people who deserve it. Yes, but is it justified like to be as brutal as he is to, to these people? Like just because he's grieving, does it give him the right to like go all out on these guys? You know, like how far, how close is Kim becoming the monster because he's the cop, you know, he's supposed to be the shining light, the pillar of justice. And yet he's, you see him throughout this movie getting more brutal, more aggressive with everything he does, all his actions and so it's just a really cool thing because it's showing him get worse, but the serial killer, yes, he is a terrible person and he is a terrible person throughout this entire movie, but it almost kind of makes you want to want to feel bad for him of all the horrible things that end up happening to him, but you're just like, fuck off. And you're more worried about like Kim becoming him. Mm-hmm. And so they do this really great thing where it flips, where the serial killer, who's the most brutal and visceral serial killer of ever, is now being chased. He's being hunted instead. And so that's one. Uh, and it's a really good character study. This movie does a really good job at character study and character arcs with like how far Kim is going to go for revenge or how far this serial killer is going to go to try and get some peace and <laughs> peace and quiet. Because that's literally all he's trying to do out throughout the whole movie. But you're just like, fuck him because he's a piece of shit. <laughs> and so um, also going from there, this is. Okay, so another thing with this movie, it makes you root for Kim hard. Like the, everything Kim does to Jang when he uh, when he gets to him, like you're rooting for him because it's just like you would want to do the same if you, as an individual, caught were able to completely terrorize the person who brutally murdered your significant other. Like if you were able to like get your hands on them, what would you do? You know, that's kind of like what right. this. 
is doing. What would you do to someone who pro- who caught your who brutally mur- murdered your significant other? And it takes it to the extreme because I feel like this is where a lot of people, if they actually say they would, this is the extreme they would go, and it's fucking insane. <laughs> um, and so, um, right. and so then if you also well, another great thing about this movie is that it also it's a great detective movie. That's another thing they got to uh, forget about this whole that a lot of people forget about this horror because of all the brutal brutality in this movie. It's a fucking awesome detective horror because Kim is like actually being a cop in this movie. He's being a detective. He's being a secret agent. You see him when he like he finally figures out who the killer is or he has an inkling of who the killer is. He goes and visits the family. He interrogates them. Like as a, a just, he just asks some questions. He keep, he doesn't like, it's really cool seeing him interact and do all these things. And it's kind of refreshing. And I feel like since they gave this movie such a long, like uh, such a long time, like long period, it like, it, it, it pays off. There's, that's what I'm saying. The, the, the time, the length pays off because it actually goes into all these small details. And so Kim ends up, uh, he goes and visits the family of this, of his potential, like, killer who he thinks it might be. And they all tell him, like, this guy disappeared. He disappeared. He just left his own son with the family, uh, with his parents. Like, and so he just left him there. And so Kim ends up talking to his son. And his son tells him where his dad lives. And so Kim ends up finding the kill room. And so he figures out that this is the actual dude because he finds his kill room and he finds his wife's ring in the drain. And so he's like, oh, shit. (laughs) And so when this point happened, like everything was going so fast, like I've had to pause the movie and I was like, this is way too early for Kim to do this. There's a good like hour and a half left still of this movie, hour 50 minutes plus, like or or hour and like yeah, hour and a half plus of this movie. Like, I was like, this is way too early because he ends up, like, catching the villain, like, not too long after that. And it is so fucking cool. Like, it is so badass. So Kim ends up finding him and he gets there. And so he actually catches Jang in the act. And I, okay, so now that I'm talking about this part, I'm not going to go over the act. But trigger. this movie is a hard, hard trigger warning. Hard trigger warning for uh, sexual assault. And as much as I already talked about the brutality, like with the brutality, because again, it kind of shows a lot (laughs) and it makes you uncomfortable. But when it comes to the sexual assault parts, they're really, really quick. You don't see it because uh, Kim stops the act every time, like right before the act happens. But it's all the lead up to it. It, They they do. There's such a good filmography and the actors do such a good job at building the tension of the possible assault and then kim just comes in and like gives you that it it gives you that endorphin like yeah (laughs) you know (laughs) like it happens in every movies where it gets you super excited like fuck yeah agent kim you're gonna kick his ass for almost doing that um but that's what the movie wants you to do You know what I mean? Like, this is a super smart movie, too, because when it gets so when Kim finally catches him, you're all excited because Kim just whips the fucking shit out of Jang. Like, he kicks the crap out of him. (laughs) Jang does not. The serial killer does not get a single punch in and he's fighting with weapons and stuff. Like, he's fighting with a sickle. He's fighting with a knife. And Kim's just like, go fuck yourself. And he just beats the fuck out of him. (laughs) <laughs> and so after he beats the crap out of him he shoves something in his mouth and you don't know what's what he shoves in the serial killer's mouth because you're thinking he's gonna arrest him or he's gonna kill him right here because in this fight kim chokes the fuck out of him with the, he suffocates him with the plastic bag near the end and just smashes his head in with a rock like he here he smashes his head into a rock like five fucking times and you think he's going to cave his head in but instead he just smashes the dude's arm with a rock and breaks his arm (laughs) you're like fuck and so after that you're like what this shit's going to happen because there's still a whole lot of movie left so Jang wakes wakes up in the same place and so uh, and so after this Jang starts like walking away but you notice Kim is stalking him and so this whole movie turns into Kim stalking Jang and just making his life an absolute fucking hell. And it's fucking great. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> and but the thing is, a lot of shit starts happening because so Jang he ends up catch um sorry. Yeah. So Jang ends up capturing uh, after this point, he's like wondering what the fuck happened too. Cause like he wakes up, he's wondering why he's not dead. He's like, what the, what the fuck just happened? Some guy just came in whipped the shit out of me and just left me here. <laughs> like, And so he wakes up, he catches a cab and he's in this cab. And I don't, I don't know why this is a scene but it, it's a cool scene, but it's something that it, it, th- it threw me off. So he's in this in this cab scene and it's a really intense scene and it's a really cool scene. But again, I'm just wondering why, because all of a sudden the guy. So he catches this cab. There's the cab driver, there's Jang, and then there's a guy in the back seat. The guy in the back seat happens to have a knife and it looks like they're wanting to kill Jang. I don't know why, but then Jang just goes, you know what? Fuck it. And he murders the shit out of both these guys in a driving cab. <laughs> like, he seriously just goes, eh, and stabs the fuck out of both of them before the guy in the back could stab him, I guess. And they crash, and he op- and after they he wakes up again, he opens the back of the trunk, and there's a dead body in there. And again, as cool of a scene it is, I was just like, so were they serial killers? You know? Mm-hmm. So it's like it's just one of those scenes where like I guess that's a I as cool of a scene is I have to throw a con in there because I don't know why it was there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um but after that it goes on and it's does and from here on it does a lot of uh, this really cool cat and mouse between Kim and Jang. Where every time Jang thinks he gets a little too far, uh Kim just shows up, whips the shit out of him for a good couple minutes and goes, Haha, I'm still gonna be following you, motherfucker. I know where you are. <laughs> like and so that's how uh and so it goes through this a couple times where Jang thinks he gets away and he's about to do something, and then Kim just comes in, beats the snout out of him. <laughs> and so this goes on a couple times until Kim finally gets, uh, he ends up fine or not Kim. Sorry. Jang actually ends up finding, uh, finding running into someone that he knows he goes to a house and ends up being another serial killer who happens to be a cannibal. <laughs> and I was like, Hey, cannibal, cannibal. And I was like, I got my two. <laughs> Yeah, and so he goes to this dude's house who happens to be a cannibal. And so, like, in my head, as great as this movie is, I'm just thinking, I don't want to live here because everyone seems to be a serial killer. <laughs> like, everyone in this movie is a serial killer. So, whatever small town they live in must be fucking serial killer central because everyone Jang knows is a serial killer, apparently. Um, so yeah, so he ends up, uh, he does this, and so they go there, and this is, and I'm, I'm gonna end it after this scene because this is pro- my review after this scene because this is probably my favorite fucking scene in the world of any movie ever, and so I'm gonna do a quick three three minute spoiler warning for this scene, and the only reason why I say that is because I really want everyone to watch this scene for themselves and understand how great it is and just how badass it would be to be Kim. <laughs> so. Spoiler, uh, spoiler warning for the scene. Uh, skip ahead three minutes and starting in three, two, one. Okay, this is now the start of the spoiler section of the scene. Um, so, right before, uh, so they go to this, Jang tells the cannibal everything, like what's kind of going on. And the cannibal tells Jang, You're being hunted. This guy has a vendetta for you, seeing as how he's the only one that keeps, uh, um, keeps wanting to beat the shit out of you like you did something um and so like this is when that's how uh, jang ends up figuring out that he actually killed kim's wife because he remembers what kim's wife told him right before he killed her and so in this scene right after that kim he somehow gets into the house without them knowing and so what's really fucking funny is that Right before, so the, you see the cannibal. He goes into this, his basement, and right before he's about to kill his most recent victim, is this poor gal. He just looks up and he's like, "Huh? How'd you get in here without letting anybody know? Because like that, that's kind of weird." And then Kim just whips the fucking crap out of this guy. <laughs> and so right before he's about to like kill the cannibal, um, Jang actually stops him with a shotgun, and then they do this entire chase in the entire house. 
And this is a fuck one of the best cat and mouse like chase scenes that I've seen in a while too. Again, um, just because like Jang is hunting a serial killer is hunting down his like his hunter, and it's done really really. Uh, and so they're like just going around, they're hiding from each other. And then Kim finally gets the upper hand on on everybody after this entire thing on the cannibal, on Jang, and on the cannibal's wife because all three of them try to gang up on him. And he gets this spike of a tent and he just beats the living fuck out of everybody. He just starts whipping them with this, like, with this pole. And he's just like, no, go fuck yourself. No, you can go fuck yourself. No, you can go fuck yourself. And he's just like, <laughs> it's just kind of like that. Or it's just like, what you know, that scene that I don't if everyone remembers this old clip of this dude at a party. Uh, kid's birthday party and he just like gets really mad and starts slapping everybody because someone pushed his daughter that's how kim beats the fuck out of everybody with this pole and then he just beats it and he uh over jang's head and then it finally breaks and this is where and this is another reason why this scene is besides just like how badass it is kim like you see him break in this scene and this is one of the reasons why also is because like he after that spike broke yeah he still goes through with everything but he like that's when he like really sees himself and he i think that's also when the moment like he really sets upon himself that he knows how far he's gonna go and he knows he's gonna keep doing it and he doesn't care and he's not gonna stop until this guy suffers no matter what happens and so eh, eh. sorry I, I tried to stop it before that. But yeah, so that's the end of my spoiler warning for that scene. And so I'm going to uh, wrap up my review here. That I know I've been going on along about this. It's a really, really, really long movie. <laughs> There's a lot into it. Um, but anyway, so wrapping up my review, at the end of the, uh, the, how the movie ends up like coming together is that Jang ends up like getting the upper hand on Kim at one point. And it really breaks you because the only reason why he does is because Kim went, he got lost that you, like I said, in, uh, in the spoiler review, he ended up getting lost in himself and he got too cocky and everyone else got too cocky. And it's one of those things. It's also like a tale of just like, you, you, you can't get lost in your revenge. Like that's kind of like the whole point of the movie is not to get lost in your revenge. But um, so Jang ends up getting, getting one up on Kim and then Kim ends up getting one up on Jang in the end. And when at the very end of the movie, when he finally like when at the penultimate scene, like you f and what really actually broke me in this is actually at the end. You, uh, when Kim finally breaks and he actually like, it's just intense because throughout the most of the movie, he's stone faced. Like even when Jang gets the upper hand on him and does something terrible, um, to him again, Kim is absolutely stone faced, shows no emotion after you see him cry at his wife's funeral in the very beginning. And then throughout the rest of the movie, he's completely stone faced. And then he finally breaks down at the movie. And it's so important for the rest of the movie, because even as br brutal and intense and adrenaline pumping as this movie is, you also got to remember that, like, even if you get revenge for whatever wronged you, it's not going to it's not going to change what happened. And that it's also best to just kind of like grieve within yourself and grieve with those that you love around you or else you might lose them, you know, grieve and find con uh, con condolences with them and like keep those who are also hurt by that, like close to you, keep your family close, keep your friends close and don't let like the terrible thing blind you to the to the point where you lose them too. And like, and you feel that in the movie and you see that throughout the whole movie and it's so fucking good. But yeah, um highly recommend this movie uh cannot recommend it enough i'm gonna wrap it up there i there's so much more that i didn't touch on in this <laughs> didn't touch on um but yeah go watch this it's uh i see the uh, i saw the devil um some quick trivia facts um is that the Korea Media Rating Board forced kim to recut the film for its theatrical release objecting to its violent content Otherwise, the film would have gotten a restricted rating, preventing any sort of release in theaters or on home video. <laughs> um, Arnold Schwarzenegger was so impressed with this film, he worked with the director on his last on his movie, The Last Stand. Um, 
Director Ji Woon Kim revealed how some Indian producers were interested in the film's remake rights. Since the agreement failed at the negotiation table, he laughed. They made it anyway. <laughs> so I'm guessing it, they actually did. Um, there's one last one that I saw that I... Oh, here it is. During the shoot, Choi Min Sik was so into character that he got the idea of beating up a random stranger who talked rudely to him in an elevator only to realize he has turned violent during the shoot and eventually freaking out. Following the film's release, he met a girl in the elevator who freaked out and panicked seeing him, having watched the, fil have, uh, having watched the film. To calm her down, he told her, I don't kill people anymore, so you don't need to worry about me. I'm a human, not a killer. <laughs> so... Yeah, so you can. Uh, I watched this movie. Uh, you can catch this movie on Amazon Prime. It also does its rotation through Netflix quite a bit. So yeah, <laughs> check it out. It's a really fucking good movie. Also, the lead character, uh, Officer Kim, he's in a shit ton of movies. I was wondering where I saw him from. He plays Storm Shadow in the GI GI Joe movies. And now we know. Yep. Because everybody's gonna remember that. <laughs> I, mean, I, I liked it. I like the first GI Joe movie. It's a guilty pleasure of mine. <laughs> I, I can't take that away from you. That is. <laughs> uh, listeners, so keep in mind this our next two episode, our, blah, 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 our next two episodes, starting with our Tuesday episode, um, we will be jumping into the history of Asian horror cinema. Cinema, excuse me. Uh, starting from the 1950s, going to the 1970s, Crystal from Horror Nights In on YouTube will be joining us for that one. And then we'll, we we will have a part two where we do 80s to modern era, talking about the history and the importance of Asian horror directors and all the amazing people that brought their own twists to the horror landscape. Listeners, you know the spiel. You know what I'm going to say. If you want to support the show, please go on Facebook. Like us, follow us there, Park Rock Horror Podcast, or on our Twitter, at OfficialPRHP, or on Instagram, Punk Rock Horror Podcast, hashtag PRHP Podcast. If you want, you can follow me on Instagram at the Undead Matt, and you can follow Cody on Twitter at Krampus Cody. And listeners, again, just take care of each other, stand next to each other. You know, it's there's no reason to turn on each other. And if you see a Nazi punch a Nazi Nazis out of the scene all the time, keep them out of the scene. Cause honestly, the only place they really belong is the bottom of a shoe because they love to lick it with that in mind. <laughs> um, I implore all of you to dive into some new horror this weekend. Let our horror recommendations fill your rooms with terror and frights. And we will talk about horror with you next time. Bye. Bye. Ghouls, gals, creeps, and mutants, we're going to jump into Darkening Skies, Swally Your Soul, and Organ Donor. Please keep your eyes open and your notifications on later this month for the full band showcase episode where we get to interview Darkening Skies. <laughs> Way to the east.